Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is, I think, MedMentors Monday panel number 66 on extracurriculars. We have two wonderful panelists today. We're just going to start off by introducing ourselves, um, just saying our names, what year we're in, and where we're from. And I can quickly go first. My name is Martina. Um, I'm in the MD-PhD program, so I'm in the PhD2 phase. I started med school in like 2020, and I am from Florida, from Miami. All right. Hi, y'all. My name is Randy. I am in the traditional David Geffen School of Medicine program, uh, currently a second year, and I am originally from Taiwan, uh, but grew up in Northern California. Hi, my name is Jordan. I like Randy. I'm a second year traditional, uh, born and raised in the Philippines. I moved to Northern California in Hayward in 2013. Nice. Happy to have you guys here. Um, so the way this is going to be structured today, we're going to start talking, start off by talking about clinical experiences and shadowing, and then going on into things like research and internships, and then um, lastly, clubs, volunteering, et cetera. And then we'll get to the RSVP questions. We actually got a lot of RSVP questions. I think a lot of people are curious about extracurriculars, probably because there's no like right or wrong. <laughs> it's a very broad uh, you know, topic. Okay, so maybe we can start off by talking about what some of the clinical experiences you had as a pre-med were. Oh, I guess I can start. Um, so for me, um, I had a lot of, I tried my hand at a lot of different things. Uh, when I first moved here to America, uh, the, like one of the very first things I did, I enlisted in the Navy to be a medic in the reserves. Uh, when I finished my active duty year for the training stuff, dropped to the reserves, did like some cool stuff in the Navy with Marines, primarily as a medic. Um, and then I worked civilian as an EMT for a few years. I did a little bit of lobotomy. I did uh, like whatever jobs available are there are that have like some combination of EMT phlebotomy requirement, um, a lot of different things uh, within that field. I also did like, I don't know if it's clinical, but it's, I did like special ed uh, for um, children with uh, movement disabilities um, for a little bit. I also worked at the VA using my like medic military medic credentials essentially to do like nursing uh, scope of practice stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then just briefly for me, um, I originally didn't want to go into medicine. And so once I sort of made that pivot towards the end of my undergraduate years, I wanted to sort of explore as much as possible within like the healthcare space. Um, so like Jordan, I did a little bit of EMT work, um, also worked in physical therapy because I thought I was interested in going into like sports medicine and things like that. Um, did quite a bit of work there and then ended up sort of working um, at a pain management clinic, um, almost in like a medic medical assistant position um, before starting school. Well, you two have way more experience than I <laughs> than I did. Um, I worked, I did also work. I worked as a CNA, um, like a nurse assistant for during my gap year, like while I was applying um, at a hospital in South Florida. Um, but yeah, well, <laughs> you guys are very impressive. Um, and I guess that kind of answers, we talked about some like jobs that would give you good clinical experience. I heard EMT, phlebotomy, CNA, um, a lot of these are good. They, they give you different, um, like views into healthcare and they'll have different like training requirements and certifications. Um. I guess if people have questions, we can go more into that. But yeah, as you can see, very varied experiences. So maybe now moving into shadowing, how did you find shadowing opportunities as a pre-med? Did you shadow physicians in various specialties? Did you shadow in a clinic, a hospital, private practice? What was that like? 
Um, yeah, for me, uh, my shadow experience is a little bit on the limited side. Um, I felt like um, shadowing, like my mindset was that shadowing is a tool for me to figure out, do I like medicine and do I like like what these people are doing? And with the experience I've had like in the military and in uh, the VA, ER, and some perspective with like EMT and phlebotomy, I felt like I had a good perspective of what I wanted to do. Um, and so I did like very minimal shadowing and specific specialties like orthopedics. But uh, other than that, I don't think I did shadowing uh, just because I felt like I had a good idea of um, what I wanted to do in medicine and uh, somewhat of a, an okay perspective of what it's like to work in the specialties that I'm interested in. Yeah, it's, I sort of second what Jonan said. I, I maybe had like 15 to 20 hours of shadowing combined. Um, I just did like half days and like all these different random things. But I also agree with Jodan that I didn't really seek out too many shadowing opportunities just because I had a pretty clear idea through sort of my jobs and my volunteering opportunities that I knew that I wanted to go into medicine and I was also involved in the healthcare space. So I didn't feel a need to seek out shadowing opportunities to sort of prove um, in a sense that I want to go into medicine. Yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> I um I did shadow, I think maybe for like, I don't even remember. Um, also like 10, 15 hours um during undergrad, but then most of my shadowing, most of the rest of my shadowing came from my job. Like I contacted physicians that worked where I was working and I didn't like I would come in separately, like when I wasn't working to shadow them. And I did that for a little while. Um, like I didn't count what I did for work as shadowing. I'm trying to remember, I think in the end, I probably had around 70 shadowing hours. But again, this is probably like much lower because I applied MD, PhD. I don't actually know um, like how much shadowing like regular MD people tend to enter with, but yeah, that's what I did. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for approaching physicians about shadowing? Just in general. Yeah, I think the easiest and most natural way to do it is to find somebody that's within whatever it is that you're doing. So if you're working at a clinical space, if you're doing research, I feel like for me, that would be the most natural way of doing things other than just reaching out or trying to volunteer somewhere than reaching out uh, to like wherever it is you're volunteering. And uh, just to add to um, what I spoke about earlier, um, even if I didn't do a lot of shadowing, I think that it's very important uh, because it's a tool to be able to answer questions like, why do you want to go into medicine? Or do you have like some understanding of what uh, medicine entails and what the doctors that you you want to be, what you'll be doing if you get to, or once you get to that point. So um, yeah, I'm not really sure how to approach physicians other than like the natural uh, reaching out to within your realm. But I don't know if just cold emailing people works though, I wonder. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how it works in the Los Angeles area. I went to school in San Diego, um, and San Diego as a system actually doesn't allow you to shadow um, at their hospitals. And so, um, unfortunately, you sort of just have to walk around and ask people. Um, we have sort of like a medical center in San Diego where like a lot of different private clinics are sort of open up. Um, I literally just printed out a resume and walked into every single private clinic and just ask them if I could shadow. Um, obviously a lot of no's, but I think some people are sort of open to having you shadow as long as you walk in with like an open mind, um, be flexible, totally understand that you wanna work around the physician's schedule and they're also very busy people um, and just ask to sort of get to know um, them a little bit better. 
Um, I think it helps if you seem like you're prepared and you seem like you know what you sort of want to get out of the experience. I think people are more amenable to having you shadow them when you come in with that mindset rather than just being like, oh, I want to check off a box on, you know, this list of all these things I have to do for medical school. Yeah, I think I just had to like cold email a bunch of people. Um, and like eventually someone said, sure. Um, but this was before I got my job. So then at my job, I just like walked up to the physician um, when it didn't look like they were too busy. And I introduced myself. I was like, hi, I'm Martina. I work on this floor. Um, I'm really interested in going to medical school. Would you be okay with me shadowing you um, at some point when I'm not working? And they were like, yeah, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I think it, it kind of is a numbers game. I've actually heard that sometimes it's helpful to reach out to, um, like the secret, not maybe not the secretary, but like a front desk or, you know, like someone not directly the physician, but maybe someone who does more at administrative work for the office or the clinic or whatever. And then, yeah, like an office manager, um, where they can sort of like, help you find an opportunity or also tell you about any onboarding things. Maybe sometimes some places have like some forms they want you to fill out or they want some sort of record about, I don't know, like vaccines. I don't know. You know, every place is different. Um, but yeah, sometimes uh, reaching out to an office manager is, it can be really helpful. Um, we have someone who raised their hand, which actually hasn't happened to me before. So <laughs> Let's see what happens if I click on view. Uh, someone raised their hand. Allow, maybe I'll allow them to talk. And if they have a question, they can ask. If not, sorry for having you talk. Okay. Okay. Chip, do you have a question? Maybe not. Okay. Um, this question is quick. Let me. I don't know how to. Okay. Um. Let's see. Let's do. Did you get any letters of recommendation from physicians you shadowed? Is it necessary to get a letter from them? Um, I didn't get any letters from anyone that I shadowed. Um, and as far as getting letters necessarily from shadowing, um, it can probably be uh, worthwhile if you had a good experience uh, and that person can speak well of your time with them. Uh, but for me, I feel like if choosing for choosing between who I'm going to ask letters of recommendation for, I just want like the best person, the person that knows me the best and can speak to my experiences, have known me the longest maybe, and I've had a strong impact in whatever it is I'm doing with them. Um, I feel like that would be the, like the best person to ask for letters in general. But yeah, if you had a good experience with the physician you shadowed, it's definitely worthwhile. Yeah, I agree with Jodan. I think one thing that I didn't realize until I got to the application cycle is that a lot of schools actually have limits on the number of letters of rec that you could sort of send to them. Um, I sort of went in thinking you could just send an unlimited amount of recommendations, but because of those limits, I really wanted to make sure, like Jordan was saying, that the people that I was asking to write my letters had a really good idea of who I was and could speak a lot to like my growth, things I was good at, things I was working on, um, et cetera. And I just didn't really feel like the half day shadowings that I sort of did allowed the physician to be able to write a good letter of recommendation for me. Um, I did end up having other physicians write letters of rec just because I worked with them in other capacities, whether it's through my job or um, through research. Um, and I think that it could be a good idea to have a physician write a letter of rec for you. Um, just to be able to speak a little bit more to medicine and how they can maybe envision you being a um, future um, provider. Uh, but I, I still err on the side of wanting to get letters from people that I thought could speak really well to me, regardless of whether or not they were a physician. Yeah, beautifully put. I completely agree. I also did not get any letters of rec from people I shadowed. 
just because I didn't shadow them for that long. Um, totally agree. Okay. Um, maybe just, do you have any like last minute advice on how to maximize your time while shadowing? Do you have any advice for making a good impression? And this can be anything from like how you act to what you wear to what you do afterwards. Um, oh, you, you can go. Okay, sounds good, Julian. Uh, I think I just have like three small bits of advice. Um, the first one being just being able to sort of read the atmosphere. Um, when physicians are really busy, they just do not like to be <laughs> interrupted, um, especially because they're thinking about something or processing some sort of information or thinking about what's the next thing to do. Um, so just be able to read the air a little bit about when to jump in with questions that you have um, and when to just wait a little bit to sort of tease out whether or not it's a good time to ask. Um, the second one being, because this happened to me specifically, um, some patients might not want you to be inside their room. And so unfortunately, you sort of have to sit outside the room and sort of sit for 15, 30 minutes, and you're sort of twiddling your thumbs, not really doing too much. Um, don't take offense to that. Um, I think every patient sort of has a right to who they want to be in their room, especially when they're talking about sensitive information. Um, and so just take that time to maybe go see something else that's happening in the office or take that time just to take a little bit of break. I don't think it looks bad on you at all um, by not being in that room. Of course, we all want to maximize our time there and be efficient. Um, and really, my third piece of advice is just be observant. Um, observe every single little thing that a physician does. So how does he or she phrase the way that they say certain questions? How do they ask patients about questions? If patients seem hesitant about sort of opening up about something, how does the physician sort of open them up a little bit more and get that piece of information that they need? Um, I think there's all of this like medicine and science that we want to learn and that we're all obviously interested in, but there's this whole sort of art of medicine where it's all about these soft skills and how you communicate with people. Um, and I think that's honestly where I got most of my learning is from that, not so much the science and how to deal with diseases and things like that. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that Randy said is very well put. And just to add to um, learning about the soft skills and um, like the social stuff in medicine, I feel like is important also for interview purposes. Because for me, like when I was doing MMIs, um, I realized after the fact that um, like during med school, I realized, oh, during that MMI, I was testing this social interaction, this social skill. And I didn't realize it until like a year later, until after I've been rejected to that school um, that, oh, yeah, uh, these are things that I could have learned from like watching a physician, uh, watching a physician's social interaction with patients. Okay, maybe we can shift into the research and internships section. Now we're getting a lot of Q&A questions, which is great. Um, okay, maybe we can start off broad. Did you do any research as a pre-med? Was it clinical research, public health research, basic science research? What was your experience? Yeah, I did a little bit of basic science research. I was uh, at a chemistry lab. My school was a little small, so we only had like very limited opportunities for research um, and uh, research as a pre-med. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, yeah, I, I actually got involved very heavily in research because I originally thought about pursuing the MSTP, MD, PhD route. Um, actually ended up getting a master's in biology, um, did research full-time for about two years. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. Um, I also did a lot of sort of anthropology and education-based research just because I wasn't in the medical field at first. Um, and so any sort of type of research actually that you find interesting, um, that counts as research. Um, it does not have to be disease-oriented, health-oriented, medicine-oriented. It just needs to have some sort of research idea and you carrying it out from the idea to the plan to how you're actually going to design the experiment and then move on from there. Yeah, as um, I guess as an MD PhD applicant, I did 
do research. That was probably like the biggest component of my application. Um, it's probably one of the most important, if not the most important component of an MD PhD application. So I think I entered in one of the Q and A's, but maybe for people on the recording, I did research basically throughout all of undergrad. Um, I started freshman year and stuck with that same lab until I was a senior. But then I also did like two summer research programs away at another institution. And that was key because I did the um, I jo like I worked in a lab that did something completely different from what I was doing in undergrad, um, like in my home undergrad lab. And actually, that topic ended up being like what I'm getting my Ph.D. in now, which is neuroscience, um, which is to say, I think. You're at a stage where it's beneficial to try as many things as possible because you don't know what you like if you don't get to experience it. But you do want to balance that with something kind of longitudinal, maybe where you can build a relationship with a mentor and get a letter from them and maybe spend enough time on a project to um, like contribute to it. So this is a very big topic. I will probably leave my answer at that. But yes, I did research. I did basic science research. I have not to date done any other kind of research. Um, do you have any advice for reaching out to professors about working in their lab or on their project? Yeah, I think uh, it also depends on like what's available within your school. For me, my school is a little, I went to Cal State. We only had like four, three or four research labs going on. Uh, but um, depending on your school, it's good to just look up what people are doing and find what's interesting to you. And maybe talking to them in person is the probably the best way to get a good response or emailing a lot of, um, sending a lot of emails and hoping for a few to reach back, which is what most uh, or a lot of my peers are doing in medical school, just emailing people and trying to see who would take them in the lab. Um, but yeah, it just depends on what opportunities there are and what your interests are. Yeah, in terms of my advice for reaching out to professors about working on their projects, um, I think it really is about sitting down in front of them and talking to them um, about any potential sort of research opportunities. And so whenever I send out emails, I really like to just very, very briefly say who I was, that I'm interested in, you know, possibly pursuing research with them. Um, maybe like a really short quip about like this thing I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and then I always ended with, do you have time to sit down and talk about a potential opportunity? Um, I didn't want to leave it as like, do you think there'd be a space for me or whatever? Um, I wanted to make sure that I sat down with them, sort of talked to them about it, saw what the lab was like, maybe even talk to other people in the lab while I'm there, um, but really have that sit down opportunity with them so that they could get to know you, you could get to know them. Um, and I think it's also a little bit more tangible. They like know exactly what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. And so you could sort of, sort of go from there to see whether or not it'd be a good fit. Yeah, your answers are really good. <laughs> you're, say you're saying everything I would have said. Um, what else did I say? Yes. Um, for MD-PhD, I guess it is nice to, like, they really, they want to know, especially in your interviews, that, like, you know exactly what you were, you were doing, like, you know the project, you know what your role was, like, you know why you were doing what you were doing, that there's some sort of story there, that you were able to contribute to the science like intellectually as well. Um, so I think it's important to look for labs where there's someone like a senior grad student or a postdoc, or maybe even the PI themselves that they're interested in sort of developing you as a scientist. Cause it's easier to get like a job or a position in a lab where um, you're mostly doing technical work and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But maybe for MD, PhD, they wanna see like a step beyond like um, do you, can you answer a question? Like, can you come up with a question? Can you work towards answering that question? And oftentimes it's hard to do that. Um, but maybe with like the right mentor or someone who's invested in you as a scientist, that can be a little easier. But um, our next question is pretty straightforward. Are there paid research opportunities? Um, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you can be hired as a like a research 
technician, uh, maybe post grad. I think there's a question in the Q and A. What advice do you have for a senior who hasn't gotten involved with research yet? How do you seek out these opportunities towards the end or after you get your undergrad degree? So maybe we can do a combination of talking about paid research opportunities and answering this question live. What do you guys think? I actually think that a paid research opportunity is sort of like the best way to tackle that. Um, I know for me, I didn't have the financial bandwidth to be able to volunteer in a research lab um, and really just do free labor for no compensation. Um, and so my research opportunities actually started off as me being a lab manager. Um, and so I helped out a lot with just like the overview of the lab, um, some of the technical aspects of like running different sort of assays and keeping cell lines going. Um, but I also made sure that when I was at my interview, um, obviously not for my first position, but when I sort of gained those skills and moved on to other labs, um, I still held like a lab manager position as like my official role, but I made sure during interviews to ask if I could also pick on independent research projects while I was there. Um, I think there's a good amount of advocating that you could do for yourself. Um, people are always open to having you do more uh, for the same amount of cost, I guess. Um, and so if you're still able to do all of your other roles that are assigned to you and you're willing to put in that extra little bit of time to pick up an independent research projects or learn a little bit more about research and how the entire process of, you know, thinking of idea and then implementing it and testing it out. If you're able to do all of that on top of sort of what you're being paid for, I, it's hard for me to believe that labs aren't open to having you do that. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of being able to advocate for yourself and maybe it taking a little bit of time for you to have those hard skills, those hard technical skills um, for you to then be able to have time to build on top with the independent research projects and things like that. Yeah, beautifully put. And for those who are still in undergrad, I don't know how it is at UCLA, but I know there's a lot of universities have these NIH funded programs like Marky Star or NIGMS Rise was another one we had in my undergrad where you can apply for those programs to get paid to do undergrad research. Um, so that's what I did in undergrad. And yeah, like Randy, there's no way I could have volunteered my free time to dedicate all that time to a lab. Um, like just financially, it wasn't realistic for me. So I relied a lot on the NIGMS Rise program, but I don't think they're always offered at every university, um, but definitely look into it. Um, we'll see, did any, did either of you do any internships or summer research programs? Do you have any advice for applying to these? I did not, I'll pass on this question. Yeah, I I did. Um, I'm, again, not totally aware what it looks like here at UCLA um, for students here, but UC San Diego has a lot of summer, summer opportunities for students. Um, so I took part in quite a few of their summer um, research programs, and that ultimately built into me pursuing my master's program in biology. Um, there's also a lot of sort of internships that are like national um, I think the NIH runs one during the summer, um, Amgen's runs one. Um, I want to say some of the different health national organizations also run summer internships for students, um, especially if you identify as being a minority or underrepresented in medicine or someone who has financial difficulty. Um, there's quite a few internships that are even subsidized so that um, you don't, it doesn't cost you any money. Uh, they also pay you a little bit of stipend over the research. Um, I would go on to Google and search up whether or not there's any of those and to just reach out to professors to see if they're able to sort of um, help you along with that process. Yes. And then this just reminded me a lot of, um, you can go work at the NIH, like after you graduate as like a research, I don't know what the official position is called, like a research, probably some sort of research technician. This is actually a really common way to spend your gap years for MD, PhD applicants. Like I met so, I met and know so many people that spent a year or two working at a lab at the NIH and that's paid. Um, 
So that's another way to do some post-grad research and get paid for it. Okay, should I try to get a letter of recommendation? Oh, sorry, before I go into the next question. Also, I remember a lot of these summer research programs, the applications are due typically around this time or like early next year. So I remember I would spend winter break basically working on summer research applications because I think a lot of them are due like January, February, March, like beginning of the year. Um, so keep that in mind if you're interested in doing summer research for the coming summer, summer 2024, you should start looking for applications and probably work on them over winter break so that you can submit them early next year. Okay, so now on to the next question. Should I try to get a letter of recommendation from my PI? Um, yeah, similar to the previous question on letters of recommend recommendations, um, I think that you always want to get letters from the people that know you best, the people that you've impacted the most. And if um, ideally uh, your PI, if you've had a longitudinal experience with them, um, they would match that criteria of somebody who knows you well enough uh, to speak well of you. Um, so yeah, if uh, it's definitely it definitely looks good to have a letter from your PI, especially if it was a long-term relationship that you've had with them. Yeah, I fully agree. I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to relationships, like strong relationships that you have with people. Um, and especially, I I think that this is quite important. I don't realistically know how important it is to admissions committees, but I also think growth is very important. And so if you're able to have someone, for example, in a research setting, say that, you know, you came in knowing absolutely nothing, you had no idea what to do in a lab, but you became this person who could just run your own independent research project. You're so good at all these sort of technical skills. You ended up presenting at national conferences and posters and all these different things. Um, I think that says everything about you and your potential to continue to grow and continue to learn because uh, ultimately that is what a career in medicine is. Um, you're continuing learning, you're continuing growing. And if you can have someone speak to that, then that's going to speak wonders about you. Yeah, totally agreed. Again, for MD, PhD, I think you absolutely need a letter of rec from a PI um, that you've worked with. I don't think you need a letter of rec from every single PI you've worked with, especially if, you know, it was really short or, you know, things didn't work out. It's okay, but you should definitely have a letter of rec from a PI that you worked with. But this is for MD, PhD again, not, not, maybe not necessary for MD. Okay. Um, I know research is a pretty heavy topic, but I think we've covered a good amount. We can move on to clubs, volunteering, and more. Um, so what are some good clinical volunteering opportunities you've participated in or know about? And also, what are some good non-clinical volunteering opportunities you've participated in or know about? Um, I can speak to some uh, non-clinical volunteering that I've done. Um, I did, uh, for me, I felt like I didn't have too much time to uh, volunteer just because I had to make ends meet. Uh, so mine was a little bit limited, but I took whatever opportunities that came. So like when COVID hit, um, the, a school near me, like, 15 minutes away from my house started um a feed um what do you call that like a program to give away food like a, a food bank um so we just i would go there in the mornings of the weekend and help load food onto vehicles um but other volunteering opportunities i don't think i've done a lot of other volunteering opportunities clinical or non-clinical unfortunately Uh, I guess I could continue with the non-clinical volunteering opportunities. I think 
you can always go back to what your interests and your hobbies and sort of skills that you have are. Um, I grew up doing pottery and ceramics. And so I actually volunteered at my local ceramic studio to just teach kids how to um, throw pots and vases and plates and stuff like that. Um, and that was super, super fun. Um, and I honestly just did it because it was something that I enjoyed. Um, it also gave me free access to the studio. So that was great. Um, and then in terms of clinical volunteering opportunities, um, one of them that I participated in, it was in San Diego, um, but I volunteered a lot at nursing homes um, or there's also senior assisted living facilities. Um, I think a lot of medicine and especially like medical school and all these TV shows and stuff, they have you thinking about like the pristine like hospitals and big, big medical centers. Um, but for a lot of folks, nursing homes and assisted living facilities is sort of where healthcare ends. Um, and I think that there's a sort of different perspective that you gain regarding medicine when you look at it from that sort of perspective. Um, and so if the more sort of perspective that you can get, the more sort of viewpoints that you have on medicine, um, I think the more well-rounded you look when you're doing your applications um, and the more people sort of think that you don't just have like rosy tinted glasses when you're looking at medicine. You understand that medicine is also tough and medicine isn't the way that all of us wish that it could be. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, volunteering with hospice patients, that can be really impactful um, or people in yeah skilled nursing facilities, totally agree. I hear from the undergrads in my lab, there's this like clinical partners program here. I think they go to Reagan. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what they do, but I know that exists, clinical partners program. Um, what else? For non-clinical, I totally agree with what was mentioned before with having it aligned with your interests. I really like being outside and one of my like non-clinical volunteering um activities was I would go out with this group of people and we would go out to these like environmentally endangered lands specifically in South Florida the pine rockland habitats are endangered um so we'd go out there and like plant uh <laughs> plant plants of that habitat um it was really nice and just like restore like small patches of land um to that rock pine land habitat um, but yeah, totally have it uh, aligned with your interests. And I think it'll be a much more enjoyable experience. And that'll actually come out in your interviews too. Like it'll be more fun to talk about something you actually enjoy doing. And that definitely shows through um, the way you talk about it. Um, were you involved in any clubs as a pre-med and would you recommend it? I think clubs are a very fun way of like finding uh, good people, um, good way of socializing, keeping yourself sane throughout pre-med, whether or not you have some leadership position or if you're just actively involved in that club, uh, regardless of your level of involvement, I feel like it's uh, definitely great to have just because it paints your story, it paints that, or for me specifically, for example, I was involved in leadership in the student veterans organization in my school and um, participate in other clubs that where there are people that I connect with, I resonate with, um, like the, I joined a little bit in the Asian uh, a PAMSA thing and uh, a couple of other things. But regardless, um, I feel like it's a good way of uh, showing that, that you uh, you do things outside of just medicine and shows your interest um, regardless of what it is. So definitely recommend it. Yes. Yeah. I, I am not the type of person who's really good with books and stuff like that. And so I probably spent a little too much of my time doing clubs and extracurriculars. Um, I, just realized that there are things that I was interested in about that there ne wasn't necessarily a club that already existed for it. 
Um, and so I eventually ended up starting quite a few clubs at UC San Diego. Um, so that was mostly my experience with clubs themselves. Um, highly, highly recommend sort of finding something that you're passionate about and finding an opportunity or an avenue, whether it's through the school, whether it's outside of school, um, to get more and more involved in it. Um, I think at the end of the day, schools are just looking for people who are passionate. And if you're passionate about X, go ahead and just explore that to the depths of it. Um, and if you could talk about it, if you could show that you're passionate about it, that's pretty much what I feel like schools care about. Totally agree. So this is kind of a two-parter. Maybe they're not related, but what are some ways pre-meds can get leadership experience? And then separately, were you involved in any mentorship or tutoring or TA positions undergrad? Um, for me, clubs are definitely a great way. Um, work can also provide like uh, some level of leadership once, like, depending on what job you get, um, research. I feel like leadership is something you can get anywhere um, in, like, any, yeah, you, it's something that you can get anywhere as long as um, you've been there enough, you've shown that your capability and whatnot, um, and regardless of you had an official leadership position, uh, you can still talk leadership, talk about your leadership and that experience during uh, like interviews and your application. Yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of opportunities for leadership positions. I think clubs are obviously what sort of comes first in mind. Um, I think Jordan brought a good point about getting leadership sort of through your work experience too. Um, like you can head up some sort of, you know, volunteer committee or some sort of committee at your work, if that's something that you do. Um, and another way you can also get leadership experience is also look outside of your school, um, look towards your communities, look through the counties that you live in. Um, a lot of them are going to have nonprofit organizations. A lot of them are going to have charity organizations that you can also reach out to and get more and more involved in. Um, that was where I sort of found a lot of my leadership experience was more outside of the school rather than within like a college or undergrad um, space itself. Oh, and I guess the other question was, were you involved in mentorship? Um, yeah, mentorship was really important to me just because um, I'm a first generation college student myself. And so I really wanted to help out other students who are sort of in similar shoes as I was. And so um, ever since freshman year of college, I just started working with um, K to 12 students that dreamed of going to college one day um, and just helping them with applications, helping them up with mentorship, almost like a big bro type of um, position where I just um, met up with them once in a while to be able to help guide them along the path um, or answer any questions that they sort of had. Um, not sure what it looks like at UCLA uh, again, but San Diego gets you really, really involved in TA. Um, I actually ended up being a TA for seven years um, by the time that I graduated my master's program. Uh, so they get you involved very, very early. Not sure if that's the case here, but um, teaching is also a very great leadership experience too, because um, you're not just learning the material yourself. You also have to learn how to then delegate that material and teach that material to other people. Seven years of TAing is really impressive. <laughs> yeah, I think I got most of my leadership experience by TAing. Um, I, I think I also got paid to do that, and I was always looking for more ways to get money. <laughs> um, so I did that. And I also just reminded me of another like volunteering slash leadership experience I talked about. Um, we had, I was I also... Um, volunteered with this group we would go to a library um, like one Saturday a month or so and then we would do like science experiments with kids that was really fun um, anything from like what did we do we would like dissect eyeballs we got cow eyeballs somehow and we were able to dissect those with them um, I think we also made like volcanoes with like sodium bicarb so little things like that um, it was really fun 
to do those experiments with kids and see them get all excited <laughs> and like think it was magic but you tell them like it's not magic it's it's science like <laughs> think about science like consider you know going into science um so it was really fun it was really cute okay and then to wrap up this um this section is it okay to talk about my hobbies in my medical school application i think we know what the answer is but i'd like to hear what you guys have to say um regarding hobbies i think one of the big thing is it paints you as a complete person if you're doing things outside of just uh things that you have to do to get into medical school um, it shows you that um, you're passionate about something and it's easier to talk about something when you're passionate about it so when you're asked about uh your hobbies in uh, like a med school interview it'll be it'll feel so much more natural uh, and like yeah and you can also speak to how your hobbies apply to medicine for example in my application i wrote about how I enjoyed playing the piano and played the piano, the piano for such a long time and talked about how I needed to develop technical skills to be able to play certain pieces, the dedication to be able to actually work towards um, completing a piece that's relatively challenging. Um, and yeah, you can use that in any hobby. For example, basketball, you can speak about uh, teamwork, coordination, um social skills etc so hobbies are definitely great um it's easy to talk about um you when you write about it there's it is still applicable towards your application because you learn things in your hobbies that may be useful in medicine so yeah definitely great to talk about your hobbies yeah i, I love what your dan said I think really through your hobbies, you learn a lot of the soft skills that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, what Jordan was saying about teamwork and communication and resilience and adaptability, all these different types of things. Um, I think you can learn those heavily from your um, hobbies. Um, I'm also going to say that it's totally fine to talk about your hobbies in your med school application. I think, of course, you want to you know, you don't want that to be the meat of everything that you talk about. You definitely want to still get involved in other things that, you know, things like research or clinical opportunities or um, all these different things that you do as a pre-med student. Um, but, you know, I'll just give a little tidbit that on your work and activities section on your med school act um, application, you get 15 different activities um, to sort of talk about. Two of mine were actually hobbies. Um, one that I mentioned earlier about teaching ceramics to kids. Um, and I think that during my interviews themselves, more people ask me about my hobbies than any of my other involvements that, you know, I did. And I sat here thinking that they were going to grill me about like my research positions and stuff like that. But I think at the end of the day, Jodan said this, but people just want to know who you are as a person. Um, we're all sort of choosing to go into medicine and we're going to be a part of the medical field. Um, but who are you outside of that? And like, who's the person that's going to join our medical school? Who's going to join this new class of students um, and is going to be a great addition to that? Yeah, definitely agree. Um I've been able to, at least for the MD-PhD program, they let us interview, like serve as student interviewers for the MD-PhD program when we're in our PhD years. And I've done that a few times now and they give us the application and I always like scroll and look for the hobbies. <laughs> um, like I look at everything else too, but like I look at the hobbies first um, just to see like, is there a hobby here? <laughs> What are they into? What do they like to do? Because it's fun. I don't know. I mean, as an interviewer or even like someone reviewing applications, you see like literally hundreds, if not thousands of applications. And um, I'm not going to lie, like they, they can start to look a little similar. And then, you know, like you're reading kind of the same things over and over again. But every now and then you get an interesting hobby that's like, oh, wow. Or it doesn't even need to be this like crazy, interesting hobby. It's just like something else, like the chances of us having a similar leadership experience is higher than us having like the same exact hobby. So that's like a way to differentiate yourself, which is actually a question we got from the RSVP is how do you different, like, how do you make yourself stand out in your application? And I think hobbies are one good way to do that. Um, 
And as I, it also comes out in the way you talk about your hobby and like, what have you done within that hobby? Cause that can be pretty different too. Um, but yeah, hobbies make you human. Um, they're more interesting and fun for interviewers and application reviewers to read about. And I highly recommend putting in at least one hobby in your application. Okay, and then maybe one question from the RSVP that's also kind of application related. Do we need to incorporate medicine into most of our extracurricular descriptions in the activities section? Um, I guess another way to ask this is, do, does everything you put, like does each activity you put in your application need to tie back to medicine somehow? What do you think? Um, I feel like the majority in some ways should, and it wouldn't hurt to tie everything uh, to medicine, even if it's unrelated. Like for, say, for example, you speak about playing the piano or basketball or some hobby. Um, it's it doesn't hurt to tie it to medicine, but I feel like um, it also not everything has to. But maybe Randy or Martina can speak a little bit more. Yeah, I think that that's a really really good question. I think I was very confused by it too, and I asked like so many of my mentors like what they thought about this and you get a lot of people who say everything should be tied into medicine. And then you also get some people who say that not everything needs to get tied into medicine. Um, I think for myself, I ultimately did not tie everything to medicine just because it didn't feel natural. Um, like, for example, I'll go back to my ceramics example. I don't do ceramics because I think it's going to help me be a better doctor. Um, and I think framing it in that way just felt really, really unnatural to me and almost felt I don't know if it's the right word, but to me, it felt that I was being a little bit fake. Um, and I, I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to present myself that way. And so really for me, it was just, this is something that I love to do. It's what re-energizes me. And that's the God's honest truth. Um, I did learn some things about myself in terms of like, for example, um, being adaptable, being able to work with sort of what you have and the tools that you have at your disposal, but I didn't necessarily tie that into how that um, could benefit me in my future career. Um, I think it has some like loose tangents to medicine. Um, you could say that teaching people, like teaching kids how to do ceramics is like teaching um, that you're going to do in the future as a physician. But I, I, I didn't personally make those connections myself. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think in some extracurriculars, it makes more sense than others. Obviously, when you're talking about clinical work or shadowing or something that's directly clinical, yeah, you want to incorporate medicine somehow into those descriptions. But I totally agree, like for a hobby, maybe like, or maybe even non-clinical volunteering. Um, I don't know that you necessarily need to like strictly relate that back to medicine somehow. Um, but yeah, people will have different opinions, but it seems like we're all kind of on the same page. Um, and then lastly, to wrap up, we did get a Q&A asking about would hobbies be placed in the extracurricular section? Um, and so maybe to clarify, so the in the application, there are basically 15 slots, like 15 spaces for you to talk about your extracurriculars. Um, and then in each slot, you have to write a description about it, but also choose a category for it. And then the category, there's a lot of categories, maybe like I think there's like 14 or maybe more, I don't remember. Um, but those categories include like research, volunteering, non-clinical, volunteering, clinical, shadowing, hobby. Like there's literally a category called hobby. Um, and so you would use one of those 15 slots to like talk about that hobby, if that makes sense. Um, what are some other, there's also like publications, there's another category. So I think at some point we, either have, we have done um, like an application rundown panel session. The recording might be up somewhere, but we might do another one next year, maybe around the time where people are applying, where we can break down like the different components of the application um, and talk about the activity section, which is a really big, this act this 15 activity section, which is a pretty big part of the application. Um, hopefully that helped clarify a little bit. But 
Yeah, maybe in these last minutes, do you guys have any advice for people trying to balance all these extracurriculars and, you know, like how to prioritize your mental health and making sure you're okay? Yeah, um, I feel like if I were to watch this, I'd be overwhelmed with the amount of things that are available that um, are recommended to be done do I do this or do I do that? Um, and it's definitely difficult, but uh, I think prioritizing what's most important to you, um, ranking those things accordingly and um, allocating your time while um, setting some time to get decent grades, because that's probably one of the most important things is doing well in school and taking care of your mental health. And then whatever comes extra after that, uh, is what I would dedicate towards um, extracurriculars towards, um, for me, I had to work. So uh, balancing work, then school, and then uh, mental health comes after. And then if I have the bandwidth to do, volunteer or do something else, then uh, that's where I would put it. But um, yeah, definitely take care of yourself first. Yeah, uh, I agree a lot with what your Dan said. And I'll also put a plug in there for people who are worried about having to fit this all into your like four years of college. Um, I personally did not. I took quite a few years after when I was supposed to graduate college to sort of wrap all these different things up. Um, I just literally one day, I just took a hard look at myself in the mirror and I was like, I am not a super person. Um, yes, some people can definitely do all these things and they stay sane and they graduate in four years and can do all these things. But I knew myself that I couldn't do that. Um, and so I just prioritized, like, I was like, I'm in college right now. I need to just get my grades on track, make sure that I have good enough grades. Cause once I graduate college, I can't touch these grades again. They literally live on forever. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to do this first. And then I graduated college and then I thought about, hey, here are the research things I need to do to get involved in, did a couple of years of that. And then I was like, okay, now I need clinical experience. Let me do a couple of years of that. Um, and I know that that seems really daunting to sort of spend all that time and sort of extend your timeline further and further for when you finish training. But I think one of my mentors told me that I'm going to look back one day and those two, three, four years that I spent extra um you know, that I thought was going to be forever. It was going to be devastating to my career. When I'm 80, 85 years old, I'm going to look back and it's going to be a drop in a bucket in the whole scale of things. Um, and at the end of the day, you're still going to get to where you want to go, which is uh, whether that's to be a physician or to be something else that you want to be. Um, and so really for me, it's just, my advice is just to uh, be honest with yourself, do what you need to do to keep yourself sane and re-energized for the next day. Um, and if that means taking extra time, then take that extra time. Okay, I'm glad I asked this. I agree. I think all the information we gave out maybe can be a little overwhelming, um, but I totally agree with what you guys are saying. Um, take your time, take the time you need. And remember that no two applications are going to look the same. Everyone's path is very different. Everyone does different, you know, everyone has different experiences in life that they, they'll talk about in their application. So don't get caught up on comparing yourself to other people or like trying to figure out what other people are doing because at the end of the day, yeah, no two applications will look the same. Um, and if you look at all the applications, even within our DGSOM like classes, like I, I doubt many of them will look the same. Um, and I don't know, that's the point. You want people with different experiences in med school. But okay, wow, that was a lot of questions. Thank you, panelists. <laughs> it was a pretty big topic for you know just just the three of us, but I think we did a good job. I'm going to, um, oh, and thank you for the attendees too, for coming and uh, sh asking all your questions. I've never gotten so much engagement <laughs> on a panel before. So thank you. Um, okay, I am going to stop the recording. Uh, th thank you all. <laughs>